Uh, good evening to all those watching. My name is Shweta Kothari and we are here to talk about Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose today. Known as India's foremost nationalist, his life can be best described as dramatic by some, so much so that there is curiosity till date. He resigned from the Indian civil services to join the Indian freedom movement and was exiled twice for more than seven years, fought against the British rule, evaded the intelligence network in India, and finally, up till his mysterious death in a span of 20 years, created history like no one. We are joined today, and we are privileged to be joined today by Chandachur Ghosh, whose latest book, Bose, The Untold Story of an Inconvenient Nationalist, is being talked about by the academics, amongst historians, and of course, the followers of Subhash Chandra Bose, Congratulations, Mr. Ghosh, for a spectacular victory on that book. And the book has hit the shelves now. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, remember, it's, it, it, was, it was released on the occasion of the 125th birth anniversary of Subhash Chandra Bose. And with the book, Ghosh has attempted to draw attention towards the unexplored aspects of Bose's life. Now, Ghosh has also explored Netaji's thoughts on independent India's developments, uh, the problems with communalism back then, geopolitics, the political ideology of Netaji, and how he was able to negotiate with political parties, with revolutionary, revolutionary societies back then, and the government of that day. Now, Bose's legacy, as we know, is mixed. Among many, many in India, he's a muscular hero. To others, he was a fascist sympathizer. So what exactly is his history and what was his vision for India to talk about all of that and more? Uh, I want to first get you, sir, on if Bose was alive and if he, if he saw India getting independence and had his vision prevailed, how would India be different today? Uh, that's a, a very difficult uh, and complex question, Swetha. And uh, it essentially, we'll have a lot of speculative elements uh, because uh, we are speculating about something that didn't happen and what could happen. But nonetheless, it's worth uh, thinking about it. the alternative. The alternative that could have been, but didn't happen. Now, uh, if uh, both uh, really came back uh, along with the captured INS soldiers in uh, towards the end of 1945 or even early 1946, uh, as uh, many of, among your audience uh, know that the tremendous reaction that the uh, trial of the INS soldiers produced, the Red Fort trial of uh, Shanwas Khan, uh, Gurbak Singh Dhillo, and uh, P.K. Saigal, the, the, the trial, uh, the INA trial, uh, the mass upsurge that it produced. If three soldiers' uh, trial could produce that reaction, just having lethargy on India's soil at that time, one can well imagine what uh, it would, what kind of reaction it would have sparked. Things, uh, I mean, the British uh, uh, Raj at that time probably would have faced uh, a revolution, nothing short of a revolution. Uh, there would have been uh, a flow of resistance and an upheaval. But that didn't happen, sadly. But uh, let us assume that he was uh, there at that time, had he been there. What would have happened? Uh, the exit of the British Raj would have been quicker. Uh, number one, one can very easily say that because uh, when the trials were underway, the trials of the INS soldiers were underway, the British uh, government of India and the British government in uh, London, they were mortally afraid of how uh, the INA trials were impacting the British Indian Army, the Indian soldiers in the British Indian Army that they were gradually turning sympathetic to the INA soldiers. They, they had no clear conception of what the INA was. In India, nobody knew what the INA was, the Azadin government was, what exactly Subhash Bose was doing in Southeast Asia. Now, as the war ended, all this news started coming in, filtering in, slowly trickling in. And then when people got to know of it, they were so overwhelmed, so much overtaken by the heroic efforts of the INA and the soldiers. The, even the Indian Army, uh, the British uh, Indian Army became sympathetic. They started uh, collecting funds for the benefit of these, uh, the families of these INA uh, soldiers who were, who were imprisoned at that time. Uh, uh, they were suffering a lot of uh, uh, adverse situations. So a lot of things. And 
uh, we see intelligence, uh, tons of intelligence uh, briefs, uh, secret letters being exchanged between the uh, commander in chief, between the uh, uh, viceroy and, and the government in London about the unreliability, the growing unreliability. They were not able to trust the Indian soldier anymore. So we see, we find Akinlek uh, asking for British troops, pure British troops, no uh, mixture of Indian soldiers there to hold the fort in India. And uh, obviously he was asked to justify, why are you thinking that? I mean, the, we are already, the British government was telling him that we are already stretched uh, with our resources. And uh, we need to understand why you are asking that. They, so Akinlek uh, explains that if there is a riot in India now, or if there is an uprising by the people now, our, the Indian soldiers in the British army are going to side with the people. And they, in secret, they were creating uh, the exit plans. And that made actually the prime minister at that time very angry. He, he ridiculed the uh, Akinlek uh, later in his autobiography that, I mean, the, our men in India were preparing exit plans. I mean, not exit plans, escape plans. So they drew actually uh, worked out routes by which in uh, the Britishers present in India would be collected from uh, key centers and taken out of India. How quickly that could be done. <coughs> so if that was the situation, then the prolonged negotiation that happened, the uh, behind the doors negotiation, compromises uh, that led to the partition of India, none of them perhaps would have taken place. That, that much was certain because there was, a, and, and the Muslim League, which uh, created the biggest obstacle to an united India, and uh, they kept threatening and uh, uh, creating problems uh, to, in the negotiations towards transfer of power. That the Indian, uh, the Muslim League wouldn't have been so powerful because the Muslim soldiers coming back with the INA, they were so enthused, so inspired by Bose's ideal, by Bose's personality, that they had almost forgotten to think like uh, Muslims the way Muslim League wanted wanted them to think. So they were like true Indians. They they were they were not able to understand the divisions based on religion. What what kind of negotiations were going back? And the best example of that was uh, Muhammad Ali Jinnah offered uh, one of the INA trials, Shanwaz Khan, uh, to defend him and to uh, support him, provided he joined the Indian uh, Muslim League. And Shanwaz Khan refused. So uh, all, all these were happening. Later on, I mean, somebody who would later on uh, go on to become the first prime minister of uh, independent Bangladesh, Mujibur, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman. Mujibur Rahman was... Uh, an upcoming leader of the Muslim League at that time. And later on, he wrote in his autobiography that at that time, people like us were in a dilemma. We used to hear speeches of Netaji from Southeast Asia and we used to cheer for him. We used to uh, long for his return to India. But the other thought that used to trouble me at that time was that if he comes back, then there will be no Pakistan. So as a Muslim League worker, he was in a dilemma. As an Indian, he wanted Subhas Bush to come back. And as a Muslim League worker, he was uh, worried that the Pakistan wouldn't work out. So that was the kind of in, impact, influence that Subhas Bush had, uh, would have had in 46, 47. So mm -hmm. independence would have come in a much more straightforward way. The exit of the British Raj would have happened in a much more of a cleaner, uh, party, uh, cleaner exit not the secrecy around and secret clauses, uh, compromises in the transfer of power agreements and all. So a lot more, India would have appeared to be a lot more self-reliant and a much more in command of the situation had we come back in 1945-46. Okay. Okay, so from my understanding of it, from a layman's perspective, it appears that India would have come out more stronger had he been alive at the time of independence. My, my, Absolutely. Question, my question to you, sir, in which cases, because we know for a fact that he had differences uh, within the Indian National Congress, he had differences uh, with Mahatma Gandhi. He was emerging out to be a very strong leader. Had he been alive, there would have obviously been a tussle for power. But what kind of political union do you think he envisioned India to be? Would he have been a liberal Democrat or an autocratic extremist? Because to some, he wanted to collect power and he wanted to be at the helm of the power. <coughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, Subhash Bose is best described uh, as the elephant, uh, the proverbial elephant 
which was to the four blind men. So somebody touched the legs and thought it was a pillar. Somebody touched the trunk, thought it was a rope. It was uh, something else. Someone touched the tail and thought it was a rope. The so Suvas was appeared different things to different people. So while some were uh, scared that he had turned a fascist, some uh, others were uh, afraid that he was too much of a communist. The communists themselves thought that he was eating into their constituency. And from that position, they opposed Suvas. So it, it was the uh, uniqueness of both was that nobody could put him into a neat box of ism. The only ism that he could fit into was nationalism. And everything else was subservient to India's national interests. Now, coming to the form of his vision of India, there were, uh, he had a very clear conception of what India should be uh, after freedom. And, that, and, and he started talking about it right from 1928, when he entered the active politi pan-Indian politics. Before that, he was active in politics, but much more in a regional scale in uh, Bengal as a as an assistant to Deshwandu Chitaranjan Das and was roaming around, but not as a uh, uh, decided leader. In From 1928, his emergence in the national uh, scenario uh, began. And that's when he started talking about his vision. So uh, he spoke about a number of things. And uh, so, uh, for example, uh, science and technology would take a uh, front seat that would drive uh, the education of the current generation to remove superstitions, the values of the old, like casteism, uh, caste and creed, and uh, suppression of uh, different groups by other superior groups. So all those caste divisions and everything, they had to go. There was no doubt in his mind about that. Then uh, he wanted uh, India's development path to be industry-based because of the widespread poverty and uh, uh, lack of health uh, infrastructure and everything. Uh, the, the way forward was uh, industrial, heavy industrial uh, development. And in this, uh, there was actually very little difference in the economic thinking between Jawaharlal Nehru and Subhas Bose. They were uh, pretty close to each other uh, philosophically, political philosophy-wise, and economically more so, economic thought-wise. And uh, then uh, he, he had a very strong uh, opinion, views on development of military capabilities, India's own military capabilities. And that is one thing which he constantly emphasized. And uh, that's one of the reasons why many people take him to be a militaristic, uh, aggressive leader. But he was far from so. He, he wanted India to be a union a single undivided India. Of course, he uh, fought against partition tooth and nail from whatever he could do from the far away South Asia. He constantly uh, broadcast his speeches arguing against uh, partition, appealing, literally begging to Gandhi and uh, Jinnah and uh, Savarkar that just drop your communal differences. This is a ploy by the British Raj to divide India to serve their own interests. So don't get, don't get into their trap. Don't let India get partitioned. Don't divide India. So that, that wouldn't have happened, that he wouldn't uh, let happen. And uh, that he could keep different communities together. And this, he uh, spoke beautifully that one of the missions of India, India has been charged by Providence with a mission uh, that it has, to, it has to demonstrate to the world that different groups different ethnic groups, different religious groups can be brought together and they can live harmoniously. And that is by showing that India will lead the world. So it, there are some beautiful elements in this. And these are far from being militaristic, autocratic, dictatorial image that has been created about him. And uh, of course, he wanted a very strong center. He wanted a very strong center, at least initially for a few years after independence. And... Uh, a uh, strong center was justified by him uh, by citing the physicalist tendencies. The, the, there were multiple forces which were trying to go at, in different directions. So there were uh, forces like uh, Muslim League. There were forces like the Indian, Indian states. The Indian states uh, wanted their own uh, agenda, or own independence and own space. They didn't want to be a part of the Indian Union. A problem which was faced by the uh, independent uh, government, particularly which had to be dealt with 
with a heavy hand by uh, Sardar Patel later on. So he uh, argued for a very strong central government. And at the same time, he said that each uh, region and each uh, uh, group will have the maximum autonomy that is possible under any uh, unitary constitution. So we'll have a federal republic. Uh, it will be a free, independent federal republic with its own flag, with its own military, with its own economic policy. And each uh, uh, constituting group will have the maximum amount of autonomy. They will have their freedom to pursue their cultural interests, to pursue their religious interests, and everything. But also, uh, there was a need for strict discipline. Now, this discipline was an element which he, uh, which makes him stand out from the contemporary leaders, his peers. He was a stickler for discipline. We, we don't see that insistence on discipline amongst any other leaders. Of course, Gandhiji would uh, insist on that, that the Congress workers at least should uh, give in heart and soul to his plan of Satyagraha, becoming a Satyagraha, how to become a Satyagraha. He had a plan, he had a description, and he demanded that Congress workers should uh, stick to that. But Subhash's uh, uh, idea of conception of discipline was broader. It was not about only one single plan. It was as a human being, as an Indian, uh, we need to be much more disciplined. And that discipline would perhaps uh, require, inculcating that uh, sense of discipline would perhaps require uh, a military training for uh, the younger generation and uh, uh, a stronger uh, framework of law and order. So to make India fit for democracy, to understand the values of democracy, they, I mean, he, he understood that there is a very thin line between a uh, chaotic, anarchical state of affairs and democracy. So often people uh, tend to uh, celebrate the fact that uh, this might be a messy democracy, but we are a messy, we are, not, we are a democracy nonetheless. So, I mean, it's, it's uh, nice for uh, intellectuals and uh, probably uh, media persons to talk like that, but for the common people who have to go and queue up and get some work done and face the hell for it, uh, democracy works there. So even when you cannot stand in a proper queue, that's that's the democracy. That's a sense. That's the value of democracy. Uh, you don't jump the queue. You don't push the other person out of the queue. They, I mean, at a very uh, transactional level, that is the value of democracy. Unless you develop that respect and that sense of discipline, democracy is not going to work. And uh, that was his argument. So, but at the, he made it very clear. He said that these are my points of view, and I am placing these in front of the people. But ultimately, when India becomes free. It is absolutely up to the people of India to choose for themselves which model they choose, which model they prefer. I'm not going to impose anything on anybody. Okay. You know, something very interesting you said. You said uh, uh, Bose was close to Jawaharlal Nehru in more than one ways, politically and in fact, in his economic ideology as well. Uh, I, want to, I want to bring about the politics of it and then maybe go to the economics of it. So politically, you said that Bose envisioned an India where states were more powerful, more, more federal, but the center would be at power or maybe more powerful than the states for a period to come. Correct. If that, that is my correct understanding of it. So initially central should be more powerful going forward. It, it should be a fed, absolute federal country as opposed to the quasi federal country that we enjoy in today. In more than one ways, you say he was close to Jawaharlal Nehru. In what more ways are you talking about when you, when you, when you say politics of it? And I want you to talk about politics of uh, Bose at this point in time. How was he more closer to Netaji? And, and, and you know, it is surprising to a lot of people because uh, Netaji today is a military, militaristic leader, someone more nationalistic uh, than perhaps when compared to Jawaharlal Nehru. But you, but, but you are clearing the air here as far as his, you know, political ideology and his economic ideology. Is yeah, see, uh, uh, there are two parts to your question and I will answer them separately. First, uh, let me tell you how close they were. Uh, Nehru was a somewhat a little more senior than uh, Subhash uh, in terms of uh, joining the Congress. He joined a little earlier than uh, Bose did, a few years uh, earlier. And uh, he had uh, come closer to Gandhi. Uh, Nehru had come closer to Gandhi and was developing under his shadow, practically. Now, in, in, in terms of mental makeup, 
both of them were uh, had a very good uh, base uh, a baseline or uh, a foundation on the western values of democracy secularism and uh, you know the pattern of education and so all these were very, uh, very common factors and they their mental makeup was quite similar and as a result they came close very quickly so both uh, nehru and bose started working together we see from uh, 1928 so, so uh, they 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 raised the demand for independence uh, in the calcutta congress resolution uh, they opposed gandhi when uh, gandhi goes with the nehru report's recommendation of uh, uh, dominion status so bose stands up and opposes gandhi nehru stands up and opposes gandhi gandhi is livid and uh, then gradually uh, nehru gives in so then when uh, subhash uh, goes uh, to exile in europe uh, nehru also reaches there after as his wife was ill bose takes care of uh, nehru's wife kamala nehru in europe and uh, they spend some time together there and then the closeness grows in 1928 they had formed an organization together uh, called independence of india league uh, so bose and nehru formed the third person who was at the top leadership of that in iil at that time was uh, somebody who became a, the president of india later on uh, zakir hussain so uh, they they had their closeness increased and as subhash was uh, planning to come back to india from his exile by defying the ban imposed by the british government he was constantly consulting nehru that what should i do uh, i want to go back should i go back so and nehru is telling him that look i cannot ask you to get arrested and then face prison and uh, suffer the consequences but uh, had i been in your position probably i would have done that and then bose comes back to india defying the ban gets arrested as expected nehru announces an all india subhash day to celebrate that his arrest and then the work of, nehru was president of the congress when bose came back in 1936 in 1937 again uh, nehru is uh, elected the congress president so uh, that in 1937 when bose is released he starts working very closely with nehru then in 1938 bose becomes the president of the congress and then they keep working and it is here that gradually the difference starts emerging in 1938 the differences start emerging the differences which were below the surface so for example uh, uh, when when andola nehru went to europe uh, he developed a very good network of international socialists and revolutionaries including indians who were uh, uh, living there at that time like virendranath uh, chakravarty brother of sarojini naidu and uh, he was uh, fondly called chakto so chakto was a very well known uh, communist leader at the time and indian revolutionary permanently posted abroad he was never back in india <coughs> he was either in brussels or in moscow or in berlin so roaming around doing indian revolution abroad so as bose comes up and draws up his radical program we find uh, there's a very very strange letter from chakto to nehru telling him that you have to be careful about bose he is a reactionary and uh, he is coming up with his radical program but essentially he is a reaction so be careful so people were already there who were uh, driving a wedge between the two and uh, bose although was very fond of nehru uh, he wrote at that uh, letter a little letter that you are the one among the younger generation among the younger leaders to who we look up to you are like an elder brother we look up to you for leadership for guidance but in his uh, book the indian struggle the his story of the indian freedom movement he is scathing in nehru's criticism that nehru although despite his modern views and modern ideas and revolutionary radical ideas uh, starts a movement or starts a program plans something and then when the dictator comes from gandhi he completely ditches his own ideas and everything throws them away and goes and surrenders at the feet of gandhi so and he was very very strong in his language about nehru and the good thing was nehru read all this criticism with uh, great uh, dispassion and himself made some corrections that you have made some mistakes here you have made some mistakes here so please correct them in the next edition 
So that kind of relation they had in the late 1930s, in the mid 1930s rather. <coughs> Nehru had a problem with Suvash's leftism because Suvash's leftism was not typical uh, Western uh, materialist uh, Marxian variety. His leftism, he was leftist in his economic thoughts, uh, but his uh, grounding was much stronger in Indian past. And he, were, he came up again and again and again about the glory of the Indian past because his argument was that as an Indian, if you are not proud of your heritage, if you are not proud of your history, then you cannot build your future. The British government has denationalized us. Now we have to get rid of that. And to get rid of that and to rebuild our country, we have to re relearn about our past and be proud of it. So you, he used to use terms like, our country has a mission. He used to talk, uh, use uh, uh, imagery of the mother when he used to talk about India, the motherland and all. Now, this part was not liked by uh, either Nehru or someone like Bhagat Singh. So Bhagat Singh also complained to Nehru that, I mean, Subhas Babu keeps talking about this stuff. And uh, this is uh, so vague, I don't understand what he means and all. So they were, so on the one hand, all of them were talking about socialism, all of them were talking about economic restructuring in socialistic lines and all. But Subhas had a very uh, large component of spiritualism in his thoughts, which was, which were missing in uh, both Bhagat Singh and uh, Jawaharlal Nehru. So these uh, differences came up later on uh, when the uh, fight began, when the conflict began between Bose and Nehru. Then uh, uh, Subhas had, he was his own person. He, although he would respect and guide Nehru, uh, look for guidance from Nehru uh, at the early phases. Uh, later on, he developed his own program. He had his own uh, thoughts how to do it. He was more involved directly with the revolutionary societies, the secret societies across the country, in Punjab, in uh, Northwest Frontier Province, in uh, Maharashtra, in Uttar Pradesh, in the eastern part of Bengal. So he was bringing, uh, bringing, trying to bring all this together and create a force which at some point of time would start a revolution. He, and that's why he, uh, he would uh, criticize the revolutionaries for their uh, acts, their actions, which were called actions at the time. So killing one district magistrate or uh, bombing one train. He said that nobody has created a revolution with uh, one and a half revolvers and half a bomb. So if you think that you will uh, uproot the British uh, Raj just by throwing a bomb at somebody, you are mistaken. But preserve your energy, think through, organize yourself, and prepare for a large-scale mass action, not individual acts. <coughs> so with that aim, uh, he started uh, building up a volunteer corps. And one of the organizations that represented this volunteer corps was called, named Bengal Volunteers. And this uh, actually scared the British administrators in Bengal and in other provinces. They were absolutely uh, petrified of these volunteer corps. That what is this Suvas plan? What are they doing? Uh, what are their aims? And they were constantly, the spies were following, tailing them, their leaders. So this, there were differences like this. And when Suhas finally ran into a conflict uh, on the economic program with Gandhi, uh, when he, as, as a president of uh, the Congress, he proposed uh, a, a heavy industrial reconstruction program and uh, set up the planning committee, the National Planning Committee, the precursor of the planning commission in Free India, and made Nehru the chairperson of the planning committee. So uh, the Gandhians were not happy about it. They, they thought that uh, the uh, small scale cottage industry were being neglected or the charka was being neglected. So Subhas had to assure them that this is not the case. But nonetheless, the Gandhians were not, never happy. In fact, uh, when Subhas was being elected the president, or selected, he was not elected in 1938, presidents were always selected at that time. The first election, in fact, took place in 1939. Uh, when he was being selected, Gandhi wrote to Vallabhai Patel that uh, uh, Subhas is not at all trustworthy. But unfortunately, there is nobody else this year who can become the president. So they just tolerated Subhas for one year. And, the, and then the confrontation uh, break, broke through and uh, the Gandhians went against him. In that fight, 
uh, Nehru tried to remain neutral for some time, but then he was too closely tied up with uh, Gandhiji to break ranks with him and uh, move towards uh, Subhas. So, and, and very interestingly, uh, much later, towards the end of Nehru's life, uh, there, there, was an, uh, there was a journalist called Taya Zinkin. Taya Zinkin was the wife of one of the last uh, Indian civil servants, a top-ranking Indian civil servant, and she was a journalist. She conducted an interview of Nehru and asked him, do you think that you let down Subhash? Uh, and Nehru had to admit that, that I, I have to admit that I let him down because the choice before me at that time was uh, between Gandhi and Subhash. And for me, Gandhi meant India. And I couldn't have left Gandhi, whatever that meant, whatever were the consequences. Although I agreed with Subhash on more points, but uh, there was no way I was going to side with him. So these, uh, it, this is a very complex dynamics going on. So more, uh, more nuance than perhaps what we see today on social media, what we know uh, uh, coming up, propping up every now and then on social media, the relationship between Netaji and Jawala Nehru was much, much more nuanced than what much we more know. Nuanced. But much more nuanced, but also towards the end <clears throat> from 1939 onwards, it became very hard. They took very, very uh, hardened stance on the both sides, other sides, each other. Uh, other uh, both sides of the fence and uh, took uh, didn't look at each other kindly. So uh, so we find uh, Suvas writing a 27 page letter to Nehru, completely demolishing his political position uh, during the last one one and a half years. Uh, that that letter was written in April uh, probably April 1939. So during the entire presidency, when when Jawaharlal Nehru writes a very uh, uh, kind of uh, mushy kind of, you know, not mushy really, but a very uh, vague kind of charges against Suvas. Suvas completely loses his school and writes a 20 page 7 letter uh, showing the flaws of Nehru's policies and everything. So Nehru doesn't uh, retaliate in that manner yeah, because at the very beginning he says, I accept your uh, charges against me and I'm not going to get into an argument over that. But then he also had his complaints against Subhas, which he also listed down. But as things moved on, there was something uh, which uh, Subhas wrote actually, which was extremely damning. He, he wrote uh, to his elder brother Sarath, and I would like to read it out. Uh, because uh, this is something that uh, should come out and as, the, as the end piece of the relation. Many people are focused only on the enmity between Bosa and Nehru and uh, the Congress historians particularly try to portray that they, everything was, they were very pally and they were very close friends, particularly for uh, historians from Bose's own family who have been uh, attached with the Congress party. They also want to show it like that. But uh, things were, things had hardened, as I said, towards 1939. And uh, let me read this. And uh, this he writes, uh, Subhash is writing in 1939 to his elder brother Swarat. The more I think of Congress politics, the more convinced I feel that in future we should devote more energy and time to fighting the high command. If power goes into the hands of such mean, vindictive and unscrupulous persons when Swaraj is won, what will happen to the country? If we don't fight them now, we shall not be able to prevent power passing into their hands. So this is a damning statement on the entire Gandhian high command. And uh, about Gandhi, I'm hearing, uh, I'm hearing the word unscrupulous, and, and and I think there is a lot more emphasis on that, on the word unscrupulous people leading the country. Quite quite surprising, uh, sir, especially when it comes to economics of it. Because at some point I read, and you've also written that Bose was one among those who looked at socialism as an alternate to nationalistic policies and in fact followed Jawaharlal Nehru at a point when he was trying to talk about uh, socialism when they were all as a bunch unhappy with Gandhi at that point. Yeah, so uh, as I said that the difference was that all of them were socialists in their program, in the economic program. So uh, took the program a few steps ahead of uh, Nehru when Nehru could take it or talk about it. So once he became the uh, president of Congress, and uh, at that time, uh, the uh, Congress party had come to power in eight out of 11 provinces. 
uh, because, uh, resulting from the elections of 19, 1935, const the new constitution that was implemented in 1935. So the elections took place in 1937 and the Congress government, state governments came, came to power. And uh, as the Congress president, uh, Subhash, asked the Indian capitalists, the Indian entrepreneurs, that we have Congress uh, governments in eight provinces. You should take advantage of that uh, and build up a national uh, industry, a national economy. Why should everything be dominated by the uh, British companies, by the British forces? Uh, this is your chance and, and, and take advantage of it. We are, our states are formulating favorable policy. Uh, so you come ahead and do it. And to follow, he, he set up meetings of the industries, ministers of these uh, provinces. He set up meetings uh, for the planning committee and he uh, cajoled and coaxed uh, Nehru, who was unwilling to take the position of the chairperson of the planning committee, laid down the broad uh, contours, the guidelines, and uh, gave them a direction. So although Nehru was, uh, of course, he was talking about leftist economics and leftist policies and, and the socialistic pattern of economy, well, Subhas was actually taking, he was walking the talk more than anybody else was doing at the time. So that was a, a, a big difference and that was also a key source of his conflict with the, the Gandhians. Okay, thanks for that, sir. I, I want to move to the the, the policies uh, and, and the understanding as far as the society at that point in time is concerned. Uh, where would this country be if, let's say, Netaji was alive socially? Now, one of the important aspects that you have talked about in a lot of articles that you've written is with respect to Netaji's opinion on women and the power that they should enjoy in the political structure. In fact, at one point, he wrote that the country cannot move forward if the women do not move forward. He, exactly. so far, he, you know, he goes so far as to say that women should be led taught self-defense and he I remember I think you've also talked about he how he once stood up in the Albert Hall and he called out the bestiality of the Indian men I want you to talk a little bit about where, where and how did Netaji stand as far as uh, position of women in society is concerned and how different would it be had he been alive uh, well again <clears throat> he came from Bengal so that helped him uh, in some kind uh, uh, with his uh, mindset, uh, where there was a very strong tradition of Shakti Puja. So, uh, and, and because of his spiritual orientation from the very childhood, uh, and he, he learned to worship Shakti, work, learned to worship women as forms of power, as, as the manifestations of power. And uh, he was a bit different from the standard uh, fare, like the uh, normal kids are, or normal uh, teenagers are, normal youth are, in the sense that he had completely taken a vow of uh, Brahmachan. And probably he, he, he always cherished in, his, in some corner of his mind the idea of taking sannyas. So for him, women were always a form and symbol of power. And when he, whenever he saw, uh, the, the, the torture on women or the suppression of women in any form, he, he, he reacted very strongly over that. And uh, this, this happened with, uh, he also got a sense of this from his political mentor, Deshwadu Chitrangandas, who, took a, who played a very big role in uh, rescuing uh, kidnapped women and destitute women he, he, he was a very, very large-hearted and sympathetic man who would fight with his contemporaries to make safe place for women, to ensure their safety. But Subhas was, again, uh, learning this from his uh, guru, from his mentor, but taking it uh, further. And when he joined uh, politics and got involved with the revolutionary groups, many of these small revolutionary groups had very active uh, women members. And uh, the, I have named a few, like there was uh, the daughter of Suvas's uh, uh, childhood teacher in the school, Beni Madam Das, his daughter Bina Das. Uh, she became a revolutionary and uh, she went and fired at the governor of uh, Bengal in the Calcutta University Convocation Hall, Stanley Jackson. She opened fire and, and her, her uh, speech in her defense is still considered a classic. 
So Binadas was younger than him, but Binadas looked up to Subhas as, a, as an elder brother. And Subhas was a source of inspiration for her. Then there were women like Leela Roy, uh, uh, Leela Nag before marriage, who came from Dhaka, the first uh, woman, the student of the Dhaka University, who taught the university uh, and uh, established girls' uh, schools and colleges. She walked shoulder to shoulder with Subhas during the rescue uh, operations in the, the terrible 1923 North Bengal flood. So women like this were constantly working with Subhas as his colleagues. And, and he was perfectly okay and happy about that. And he, in fact, wanted more and more women to join the revolutionary movement, to join the Congress. In 1928, uh, the volunteer court uh, that he sets up to conduct the uh, Calcutta Congress in 1928, December, a uh, large part of it was only women's court. So they were formed of only women trained in drilling. The, he wanted them to carry daggers, but the police did not permit. Uh, the police uh, refused permission. So they couldn't carry daggers. So, and this idea was finally taken, given its final shape in the form of the Rani of Jhansi regiment. And uh, I mean, the instance which, the, the example which you cited, his speech in uh, the Albert Hall in Calcutta, that was while he was president of Congress in 1938. And uh, this was a meeting where, uh, uh, I mean, it was convened to condemn the torture on women. And uh, Suvas didn't like to uh, faff around. He didn't waffle. He, he was very plain spoken. And that, is, that was another key difference, which I will come to it later a little bit more, that there was a difference in the language of politics of Subhas Post and the Gandhian wing. There was a lot of circumlocution and waffling when, if you look at the Gandhian political program and compare it with uh, Subhas. So Subhas stands up and says very clearly that, I mean, uh, I, mean I have seen very few uh, countries where such a large proportion of men are uh, bestial and lustful. And, and, and then you claim yourself to have a spiritual heritage. You should be ashamed of yourself. I mean, why should women have uh, reserved seats? Why do they even need to have reserved seats in uh, public transport? If you, if you are civilized enough, women don't need uh, reserved seats. And uh, he said, I don't uh, advocate uh, flogging. I, I don't support flogging. But in this case, in case of harassing women, torturing women, if teasing, I am perfectly all right with any person who does that being publicly flogged. And uh, besides other punishment. And then he makes this case of women have to learn self-defense. They, they need to be able to defend themselves and not uh, be shy in their public life, not as if they're getting tangled in their feet, in their dress, and not able to look eye to eye uh, with any person that they're talking about. So he had a very, very modern outlook. It was partly out of his spiritual uh, upbringing, partly out of his very liberal up upbringing in his family where women played a very dominant role. And uh, uh, there, uh, I, uh, we don't find, I mean, I have given the comparison, uh, the contrast with the Gandhian emphasis on purity of women, that if uh, men yes. are, women are pure, then they are nobody can cause them. Yeah, and that's where it gets more interesting. You know, I, I was reading about that and that, 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 made, that was surprising to me as a young person. Uh, Gandhi talks about purity of women and, and you, you write yourself that he says, if a woman is pure, no evil eye will be able to hold her or confine her. But right. at the same time, you have a contrast here of Bose who says, you know, purity is not enough. You will need to know how to defend yourself. And, and that's a stark irony, sir. And to a young woman who's reading about it now, I did not even know that, 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 that such were the opinions held of women back then. Exactly. And, and that, was, that is what, uh, uh, what, what Gandhiji actually uh, wrote, that women find, it much, women find it much easier to die than men. And uh, if, if by purity she cannot cast off the evil eyes, uh, then uh, she should rather die. I mean, she should rather die before uh, uh, something bad is done to her. So that's, that's a very uh, medieval, I won't even say medieval, probably that's a prehistoric and uh, amazing sort of view. And uh, she, he, he went on to write about women, modern women that they paint themselves and probably they want uh, half a dozen Romeos around her and all. And, uh, and a group of uh, 
uh, uh, women from Calcutta found it very, very objectionable and they wrote a very strongly worded letter to him saying that, I mean, we are shocked to hear something from you, uh, you who depend routinely in your political activities, in your other activities, depending on uh, uh, women. And you, you look at them with such uh, contemptuous uh, views. So, and the, you, again, the, as I said, circumlocution and uh, never being to the point was uh, a uniqueness of Gandhian's uh, language. So he could all he could easily very very easily shift his position whenever charged or cornered about something. So he would he would always keep the escape route open and say that no, I didn't mean that. What I said is this, and then go on to open about that. So uh, that 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 that's again what makes Subhash very endearing to the current generation, to the younger generation, that they like plain speaking, that they like to the point uh, uh, unpretentious talk and. Speak your mind, and and it, the added advantage is the high ideals that a man man like Subhash Bose represents. So there is a very big contrast there in, in terms of modernity, in terms of uh, mental outlook, in terms of uh, political program, in terms of spirituality. Uh, so the, Subhash and Gandhiji, or despite Subhash's respect for him as an individual, uh, they are probably couldn't have been two more different persons than they were, Subhash and Gandhi. Nehru fell somewhere in between and Nehru chose to be with Gandhi. That was the tragedy of India, in my opinion. Right. I, I want to shift focus now to uh, religious opinions of, of Netaji. And, and how, how, how did Bose envision India to be? Uh, did he envision India to be a Hindu nationalistic country or, or a Hindu nation or was he more liberal in his approach because you know you, you've written somewhere and, and you talk about how uh, as far as Savarkar's role is concerned you say that although they hold very strong uh, you know opinions against each other when it comes to politics of uh, Vinay Damodar Savarkar and the Hindu Mahasabha however mm -hmm. you say that he wasn't anti-Savarkar that he wasn't anti-Savarkar in fact it was more nuanced can you elaborate on that, please? Yeah. Uh, let me let me clarify on the point of Savarkar. Uh, uh, I didn't say that he was not anti-Savarkar. He was uh, completely against the political program of Savarkar. And he criticized Savarkar's political program in very strong language. But at the same time, he saw Savarkar uh, in, in totality, in a, in, a, in a very holistic manner. Savarkar uh, was not born in 1937. Savarkar's political life goes back much further. And uh, his uh, days as a revolutionary, the amount of torture and persecution he had gone through, the, his thinking, his uh, capability of thinking as a thinker, Suhas had great respect for that. Uh, there is no doubt about it. He was at the same time extremely unhappy about Savarkar, Savarkar being fixated with uh, which he wrote in his own book that uh, Savarkar is not ready to do anything for India. He does not have any idea about global politics. He is fixated with his uh, idea of uh, admitting, enrolling Hindus in the British Indian Army with the sole aim of training them uh, militarily. So he found that very ridiculous and he uh, criticized it as strongly as possible. But at the same time, uh, I have written in one of my articles, I have written it in the book also, that uh, Suhas's political uh, mouthpiece, uh, which was also called the forward block, his party was called forward block, his mouthpiece was also called forward block. So there was an article which analyzed Savarkar. I mean, Savarkar was thoroughly criticized. His, his speeches were mercilessly criticized. But then there was a very sympathetic, uh, long article, analytical article, showing, the, I mean, calling Savarkar uh, a, a brilliant revolutionary, a brilliant thinker and all. And then it lamented that because of the extremist Islamic politics, Savarkar uh, has chosen the wrong path. He has been too influenced by the extremist Islamic uh, politics. And uh, instead of joining the Congress, uh, when Savarkar was released from the uh, British prohibition of being in public life, Suhas had welcomed him and expressed desire that Savarkar should join Congress. Uh, Savarkar joined Hindu Mahasabha and uh, 
followed that line of politics. Uh, Subhas was naturally not very happy with it, but he never lost respect for the man that Savarkar was. So there were differences, and he went and met Savarkar in 1940 uh, to bring him back into the mainstream, to make him a part of the resistance that he was trying to build up against uh, the British Raj, uh, the final push that he was planning in 1940 that uh, bring together all revolutionary societies, bring together all non-Gandhian, non-Congress uh, political groups, and then at a single point of time, start a mass uprising across the country, uh, uh, Satyagraha or a civil disobedience called, give whatever name you want. So he wanted Savarkar to be a part of it. And he was extremely disappointed that Savarkar refused to understand his point of view. Savarkar refused to understand his point of view and Suhas failed to understand Savarkar's politics. So he criticized Savarkar. But at the same time, he had great respect for Savarkar as an individual, as a political worker and as a thinker. Savarkar returned the same feelings. Savarkar never criticized Suhas. In, he criticized Suhas's politics. Of course, he did. But when Suhas left India and uh, Savarkar wished him the best, he said that uh, as a son of Mother India, let him be strong enough to achieve the goal he has set out for. And hence, henceforward, even till the end of his life, Savarkar always mentioned Subhas Bose as one of the factors that catal catalyzed the exit of the British Raj, uh, which Savarkar uh, did not give that credit to anybody else in the Congress. He always specified and singled out Subhas Bose. So that is what I have uh, highlighted, that yeah. They were politically very different, but again, it was very nuanced. Okay. So, so just, just to come back to that. So what I mentioned is that you say the boss wasn't anti-Savarkar. Was, he, was, he wasn't anti-Savarkar is what you continue to maintain. Individually. He, politically, he was. Okay. So politically, politically, they had different point of views, but Absolutely. as far as individuals is concerned, they had huge respect for each other and their work. Yeah. There was no meeting ground, politically speaking. So, uh, and Bose was a very uh, stringent critic of Savarkar. So, politically, there was. But there are two sides. That's what I said. Politics is one aspect of it. Individually, personally, there is another uh, aspect of it. So, that's there. And uh, the other point you mentioned about Bose's points on uh, religion. Yes. And uh, is, uh, uh, Bose was a very you know, curious mix of a secular individual in the sense that he said he, he took a, a position which said that uh, to uh, marginalize or to persecute any religious group in our country is against God's law. So every religious community should have complete freedom to follow their own path. And at the same time, he advocated that uh, the, the, the cultural intimacy the different religious groups should try to know more about uh, each other. He, he was worried, what worried him was that uh, religious exclusivity. He said that the Hindus don't know much about Islam. The Muslims don't know much about the Hindu cultural uh, practices, religious practices. The Christians, the Parsis, they're all living in pockets. That should go. Each group should try to know each other far better so that even in terms, even when there are conflicts, when there are disagreements, they can be settled amicably. <clears throat> so that was his uh, ideal. And that is exactly what he practiced when he created the Azadin government in Japan or the Indian Legion in Germany. But having said that, Suhas was also the kind of secular who wouldn't be shy of uh, showing him publicly as a very proud and devout Hindu. So he wouldn't advertise his Hinduness, uh, but when, it, when the opportunity presented itself, he would stand up in, uh, in, in defense of Hinduism. So uh, in Mandala Jail uh, in 26, 1925-26, uh, we find that Suhas is organizing the uh, revolutionaries uh, imprisoned there uh, against the Burmese and the Bengal government who had refused to pay allowances for Durga Puja and Saraswati Puja. So he writes uh, a very uh, in a very deep letter to the governor, say, talking about the European, arguing against the European model of secularism. He says, your secularism has 
uh, ha has drained out the sense of spirituality out of your races. So you don't know what it means to be spiritual and religious. We Indians, religion means the life breath. And uh, it, it, it is not just a show, it is not just a festival. It means much more to us in our daily lives. So we, till the last breath, we will defend our religious rights. You cannot uh, uh, take away our religious rights. And the same thing again happens later in 1929, 1930, when he organizes Durga Puja in the Ali Puja in Kolkata. So the government doesn't give him permission, doesn't give allow funds, and he goes onto a hunger strike, and finally he does the uh, puja. So whenever public, and then another instance I would give where he had a, a, a conflict with uh, uh, Ravindranath Tagore. Ravindranath Tagore was uh, from the Brahma community. And uh, in one of the Brahma hostels uh, in, in, a, in Kolkata a College, it was called the City College, which was a Brahma institution. Uh, the Hindu students in the hostel who were numerically superior, they wanted to do Saraswati Puja. And the hostel authorities and the college authorities prohibited them from doing so. So what stood by the, the by the students? They said that the students should have the religious liberty to follow their own religion. Why should they be prohibited from uh, doing their own uh, uh, festival? So he took a public stance. He allowed freedom for all religious groups. And for him, the, the nation building was so, so far more important that these issues were at the background. But he wouldn't compromise there also. So he had, and, and, and he wanted Hinduism probably as a proselytizing religion. That's, that's very uh, uh, unlike of a man like Subhash. So, he, so you cannot, as I said, you cannot fit him into a box of any ism. So he was not a secular in the current uh, mode of uh, political discourse that we have today. I mean, someone who is secular today is almost scared of calling himself or herself a Hindu or a Muslim or a Christian. He is a secular or she is a secular. So uh, individual secular, I don't know what that means, but uh, I mean, uh, possibly just a faithless person. But Subhas was very proud of his uh, faith, his system of faith. And he was not a theoretical uh, a spiritualist. He was somebody who had taken to the uh, practice of uh, religion, religion, which is sadhana, uh, from the very early age. And we see him uh, getting into Tantri sadhana in Mandala Jail. It was, a, it was a very unique feature which we see repeated uh, all the 11 times that he was in prison. And all his inmates have uh, uh, vouched for it that wherever he was located, in his cell, there would always be a corner which he would cover with curtains. That was his puja space. And nobody had access to that. That was his individual, absolutely private space. So he was a practicing uh, uh, sadhak, you, as you might say. Even during the World War, Second World War, when he is leading the fight, the war, a government, he would take out time, uh, one hour or a couple of hours, go to the uh, Ramakrishna mission in Singapore, meditate there for one hour, two hours, and then come back. In, in his saffron robes, he would do this thing. And not a single person of uh, his government or his uh, army had a problem with that. And mind you, that the topmost uh, army generals uh, in the INA and in the government were non Hindus. Most of them, uh, SAIR was a Christian. Uh, 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 the, the chief of army staff was a uh, Muslim. The, the, the chief of staff was uh, a Sikh. So, uh, and, and you will find these people absolutely ready to throw away their lives at one single command of Metaji. So, he was a secular in, in the truest sense. He, he had a deep belief and faith in his own religion would not impose that on anyone, allow others to follow their uh, religious path and try to bring everybody together. And that was his vision that he executed in the INA and the other things. And probably would have done so for example. Okay, so, so to all those uh, extreme right wing at this point in time who, who, who consider Netaji to be their chair leader would be disappointed therefore to know that he was a secular and did not Although he carried his religion on his sleeves, but did not really, there is no academic evidence, if I'm, if I'm understanding this correct, there is no academic evidence to suggest that he would be a supporter of Hindu Rashtra. Uh, uh, no, I mean, not in that sense, but uh, it is also uh, not probably right to uh, 
judge retrospectively because uh, by by putting by looking at him through the filter of uh, the discourse in 2022 we are judging him we are judging a man who was living and acting in 1945 so obviously the situation was very different there and uh, very but as i said i mean even in 1945 he was so far ahead of his time because his vision was an indian nation where uh, different ethnicities different communities would come together again i i mean i like to reiterate and uh, i mean reinforce this again and again that he saw india's mission to lead the world in bringing together diverse communities and ethnicities and religious groups and who can live harmoniously and present an example to the world in in the world of strife i think that is a thought uh, which which uh, articulated in 1928 was far far ahead of its times so but politics may have changed since then but the social fabric hasn't has it uh well <laughs> i mean i mean i mean just just to understand you're right that it 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 would not be correct for us to make judgments at this point in time we are far far more um, into the future but the social fabric remains the same we still have the uh, challenges have changed yes the nature of challenges have changed the mm-hmm. nature of uh, uh, political discourse the nature of communal conflict these have changed i mean communal conflict uh, for example the biggest communal conflict in calcutta for example in 1926 was over uh, the passing of a procession which played music in front of a mosque today we are talking about a, a properly organized global movement of terrorism sleeper cells uh, 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 and, and a political ideology in the garb of religion trying to occupy uh, uh, territory or populist or people's mind there are uh, globally funded uh, conversion uh, initiatives the, the, these things and the reaction to these from uh, the people who feel that they are being at the receiving end these have changed the kind of discourse that we are having today and uh, but i agree with you here at one point that at the core the values the core values have not changed the core values should remain same and the core value that was there in 1945 i believe the core values should be the same even now if the dream was to uh, live uh, harmoniously and with love uh, in, uh, i mean whatever the way of working it so was had his own views and his world world view was very very specific and uh, not vague there is no reason why we shouldn't have why you should lose that value yes so that value the core value should be this yes and 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 given the fact as as you've mentioned again and again um and now we have it solid clear in our minds that unlike unlike jawala nehru he was very clear on what he wanted and he would not change easily he he was yeah. he was firm and clear and would not change would not let others affect his political ideology and his social ideology right he was ready to learn but he was always uh, very uh, wary of the fact and uh, in his broadcast from germany and japan one thing was uh, a permanent feature that he was warning the indians all the time to his listeners that don't let uh, jawaharlal nehru and mahatma gandhi enter into a compromise with the british government because this they begin a campaign in a very nice way particularly mahatma gandhi begins in a brilliant fashion takes it up to the peak of it and then somehow loses now and looks for compromise so don't let them compromise okay okay now that you mentioned J- japan and germany what do you make of his collaboration with the fascists and the nazis because you know we we've seen pictures sir, and and that's where bos continues to be divisive bos continues uh, to have followers ardent followers as well as haters because he reluct he he did not he was reluctant to criticize the worst excesses on jews the german antisemitism he did not at any point of time come out and openly say no i do not support them so what do you make of the collaboration with the you know the nazis in germany and the fascists in japan 
Uh, well, one thing we have to understand is that uh, we, we should remember when we are discussing and debating this issue in 2022 is that uh, Subhas Bose was not an administrator of a Facebook page or a YouTube channel. So he, he, was, he was not pontificating, he was not in charge of pontificating or uh, moralizing. He uh, was a leader of a national movement whose sole objective at that time was to win freedom for India. And for that, it meant working in uh, whatever way that, that served India's interests and nothing else, nothing more, nothing less. So uh, in his speech uh, as a Congress president in 1938, he made one simple point which evaded the attention of many leaders at that time. Uh, some very shrewd and uh, attentive leaders like uh, Kripalani noted it, uh, but the meaning became very clear to the other leaders later on, where he said that it is none of our business what is happening inside other countries. Our objective is solely to win freedom for India. What any country is doing within its own boundaries is its own problem, and we are in no position to interfere there. So that, that was his stated position. And he clarified it in 1939, uh, saying that uh, India should think of her interests first. And when I say that Subhas was, was far ahead of his time, uh, it's not an exaggeration. Because this uh, statement that India should think of her interests first uh, re-emerged as the election campaign in 2013, when Prime Minister, led to be Prime Minister Modi and then Chief Minister came up with the slogan, India first. So that slogan, which was relevant in 1939 and which people failed to understand, uh, was uh, relevant in 2013 also. So uh, let me, I mean, in terms of his views towards uh, Germany, I will very quickly write, uh, read up a letter, a couple of lines from a letter he wrote to uh, the head of the German Academy in 1934 uh, to uh, someone called uh, Theofilder. Now, uh, Franz Theofilder, he writes, I regret that I have to return to India with the conviction that the new nationalism of Germany is not only narrow and selfish, but arrogant. Apart from this new racial philosophy and selfish nationalism, there is another factor which affects us even more. Germany, in her desire to carry favor of Great Britain, finds it convenient to attack India and the Indian people. I am still prepared to work for an understanding between Germany and India. This understanding must be consistent with our national self-respect. So this, is, uh, this letter was actually the culmination of Suvas's stay in Europe largely uh, in and around uh, Vienna and Berlin, Czechoslovakia. So there he got attracted by the uh, uh, quasi uh, military movements and the forces. And what attracted him was a sense of uh, self-respect, a sense of a sense of nation, nationhood, and the sense of discipline. So, and he thought these qualities were very, very desirable and had to be brought into the Indian public, into their consciousness. So he, he tried to work out with those organizations in a way that the values could be uh, transferred in some ways to the political discourse in India. Uh, there were other things that he was interested in, like municipal governance and all, I'm not going into that now. But what he did in a major way was that uh, he stood by the Indian students and guided them in Rome, in Berlin, in Czechoslovakia, wherever he found them persecuted because of the skin color, because of their being Indians. He represented them to the respective governments, wrote petitions for them, wrote news in the newspaper articles and letters, and condemned the government policies. So he was very, very uh, vocal about it. It was not that he was uh, having some sort of uh, uh, you know, uh, hide and seek over, over this thing. He was not trying to present himself as a good man to them. He was, if he, if he thought, as I said, that he was known for his plain, plain speaking. So if he thought it was bad, he made it very, very clear publicly that I am not happy with what you are doing and your laws need to change 
your attitude towards Indians need to be changed. As far as Jews are concerned, he had great respect for the Jews as a race, and uh, his sensitivity. There are not many documents available about on this, and uh, the story of his attitude and mentality towards the Jews comes from a Jewish uh, uh, professor herself. A Jewish professor who was living in Berlin at that time and happened to chance upon him and was so mesmerized by Suvash, uh, she and her husband. Uh, and uh, Suvash advised them to leave Berlin and uh, move over to, uh, to the US. So they went and settled in the US. Many years later, she wrote uh, a book which uh, of her recollections of Suvash. And one has to read that book to actually feel how uh, humane and sensitive as a person Suvash was. And they had, obviously, they had arguments. And they challenged Suvash that you are trying to uh, get help from the German government, but th they are monsters and they are persecuting the Jews and torturing everywhere. Uh, Suvash said, of course, I know that and, and I don't support it. But what can I do? Am I going to uh, lecture them what they should and what they should not do in their country? Why would they listen to me? And is that my priority right now? When the British are doing the same thing, exactly the same thing that the Germans are doing to you. The British are doing the exact same thing to my millions of countrymen. So I have to uh, uh, rectify that thing first. There lies my responsibility. And once that is done, then I can think of world problems like this. But this is not my place. This is not my job. This is not uh, my time to talk about it or create a campaign about it. So. It was all very well uh, with uh, uh, Gandhiji or Jawaharlal or even or even uh, Rabindranath Tagore to uh, criticize uh, and be critical, remain critical, and take a side against the Germans uh, because their worldviews or their political views were different. So was was planning something different. So he was working like a true uh, global diplomat. I mean. Uh, if, if you look at uh, all the Western liberal democracies today, uh, particularly the, I mean, the, the countries which are the source of these kind of criticisms, which claim to be the flag bearers of democracy and liberal humanitarian values, uh, and they are the ones who have given rise to the jihadis, to the uh, mujahideens, uh, where, where, where we find uh, UK supporting Saudi Arabia to be a member of the UN uh, Human Rights Council. So, I mean, um, why, why would they do that? They would do that only because it serves their self-interest. And self-interest, national interest, is a sole uh, guiding principle of global politics, of geopolitics. And that is exactly what Suhas was, was doing. He was not uh, moralizing. And even when he was there in Germany, when he went to Germany, first thing, let me make another point clear, that uh, when Suhas left India in 1941, he had no plans to go to Germany, got it. He had been preparing his escape plan for the last one year. And all the routes that were being considered, all his revolutionary secret network that had been mobilized, everybody was working to create an escape plan to Soviet Russia. When Suvas so, so reached Kabul in January uh, or February uh, 1941, it was then that the Soviet government told him that he couldn't go to Moscow or Moscow wouldn't take him in. At that moment, Subhas had two options. Either he should go to another country or he should come back to Kolkata. So anybody who's uh, raising questions, first thing she or she should do is to place himself or herself in the shoes of Subhas Bose outside the uh, Soviet embassy in Kabul standing in knee-deep snow after waiting for seven days and being refused entry. So that, that's when the, they approached the German and the Italians and uh, they were ready to take Suhas in. And uh, he went along with them. And even when he reached uh, Germany and Italy, uh, in Germany, he never gave his allegiance to Hitler's plans or activities. So when even after being refused by the Soviet Union, even after being refused entry by the Soviet Union, when Germany attacked uh, the Soviet Union, he uh, criticized the German government in his letter to the foreign minister, Ribbentrop, not to anybody else, 
to Ribbentrop in the strongest language. He said that the whole of India is going to turn against you because what you've done is a blunder. And this does not make any sense. And people in India see Soviet Union as a benefactor, as a friend. And now you have attacked them. So he was again, he was criticizing their policies on, the, on their face. He, uh, when he's meeting soldier, is, uh, sorry, when he was meeting Hitler, in, and Hitler starts lecturing him, uh, one of the interpreters later recounted that he spoke in English. He said in English that, please tell your excellency that I have been in politics all my life, and he does not need to lecture me. And the interpreter was so scared that he, he refused to interpret that line for it. So that, that remained uh, unmilitary. Um, this came from one of the interpreters present in the room. So he was that kind of man. And, and when he ultimately comes to Japan, uh, uh, the Japanese ambassador and Hitler has a meeting to discuss what Suvasbos is doing in Southeast Asia. And uh, the Japanese ambassador sends a report of this meeting, the minutes of the meeting, to Tokyo. Now, by the time the Allies had already broken the cipher code being used by the Axis powers. So this uh, telegram is intercepted and it goes to Australia. Uh, and and, and they, they read it. So we found it from the Australian archives. There the Jap Japanese ambassador is telling Hitler that uh, Jap the, the Japanese government has given Suvaspos a blank check in terms of his plans and everything. So Suvaspos, wherever he went, he went on with his own plans and ideas. He was nobody's man. He was not playing to anybody's ideas or guidance or dicta. Rather, I mean, even when he, the first time he reached Tokyo and wanted to meet Tojo, Prime Minister Tojo, uh, uh, Prime Minister Tojo was very busy. The war was going on. There was no reason he should meet someone like uh, Subhas Bose. But, but uh, due to the pressure of his cabinet and other military leaders, Tojo agrees to meet Subhas Bose for a few minutes. And when he meets Subhas Bose for a few minutes, that few minutes extends to a few hours. And by the end of the meeting, he is so impressed that Subhas Bose asks him that I want your unconditional support. So there will be no strings attached. I'm not promising you back anything. So I am not going to give you anything, not on, on, on my behalf, not on India's behalf. So are you going to help? Are you ready to help? And Tosha promises, instantly promises, gives his promise that he will help unconditionally. So that was the force of his personality. That was the force of his ideas. He could convince, he could communicate, and he was nobody's man. So ideologically speaking, before going to Japan in 1927, he had written a long article criticizing Japan because of its atrocities in China. So ideologically, he was with none of those Axis powers. But those Axis powers were helping him in his struggle to free India. So obviously, he was not going to pretend that he didn't need them and he was not uh, thankful for their help. Of course, he was grateful for their help. Nobody else was helping India at that time. And the Japanese and the Axis powers were doing them every bit. The Japanese, the German government didn't expect anything in return. But they were pouring money. They were investing in uh, manpower. They, and the funny thing is the German foreign office set up, which was helping Suvas, bulk of them were anti-Hitler resistance force people. Uh, but the German foreign ministry were funding them. So why would they do that? I mean, there was no obvious return from Suvas. He was not talking about fascism. He was not singing pens for Hitler or uh, Mussolini or Tojo. Of course, he was thanking them uh, uh, wherever he could because of the help. And he should have. And anybody should have. Right. But that's global policy. That's geopolitics. Okay. Very interestingly, as you pointed out, he was nobody's man. So although he was visiting all these countries out of necessity and he was impressing them with his caliber, his, his ability to you know, change discourse, but at the same time, he was not supporting any of these fascist or the Nazi regimes. But you know, you know, coming, coming to the end of it, and we've already overshot our time, but I, I want to end with one fundamental question about Netaji on everybody's mind. And that is with regards to his death. Death remains mystery. What have you discovered through your book and through your uh, the archives that you've dug into for the research of this book? What exactly happened? Well, the question what happened to Netaji was probably the biggest, India's, modern India's biggest political mystery. 
And uh, I mean, standing today, I can confidently say that we have an answer to the question. And with enough strong evidence, all sorts of evidence, eyewitness accounts, documentary evidence, forensic evidence, uh, we have uh, proved that he came back to India in the early 1950s and uh, uh, lived here till the last moment, till the moment of his death in 1985, 15th September. That was the end of him. So can we now say for sure that he did not die as people presume him to have died? He died no on the Indian soil? Absolutely. And and can can you please, uh, you know, just, just as a curious listener here, what sort of evidence do we have to suggest that? Uh, uh, numerous source, uh, evidences from numerous sources, not one evidence from one particular source. Uh, we have collected sources from different sources. Uh, evidences from coming from uh, his extensive revolutionary network, which he had before he left India. Uh, uh, the Anushilan Samiti leaders, uh, the leaders from uh, revolutionary groups like Sri Sangha, they all came together and came to this man to help him. Uh, there were uh, people from uh, uh, the Navajavan uh, uh, Samiti in uh, Uttar Pradesh. At least five chief ministers in UP were in touch with him. We have enough evidence to show that even the government of India, at least from the time of the uh, Bangladesh War, Liberation War, was in touch with him. And uh, they knew of his existence in India. Even the current government knows, although they will not ever speak about it. And uh, we, have, uh, we had his handwriting examined through an independent expert, a top yeah, handwriting expert in the US, who had no idea who Subhash was, was and who this person, uh, we, we set two sets of handwriting samples of this man called Gumnami Baba or Bhagwanji, who lived in Uttar Pradesh his last days, last years, and uh, of Netaji. Without knowing, having any background, he examined the uh, 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 handwritings. He, he follows the FBI methodology and gave a detailed uh, report showing that the handwritings match. To corroborate that finding, we independently got the handwriting samples tested by a top handwriting expert in India and without giving him the background. He also came to the same conclusion. Then the biggest obstacle was that the DNA was not matching. The DNA uh, extracted from the teeth of Gunnami Baba was not matching with Netaji's family members. So obviously that was the biggest obstacle because if DNA doesn't match, then the two persons cannot be same. There is no question. So we looked deeper into it and then we realized how very nicely a fraud was carried out, a forensic fraud was carried out in uh, government labs. Very, very smoothly and uh, subtly. So in uh, one uh, lab in Hyderabad, uh, they tested two teeth, took out pulp, and then they said that there is not enough DNA available. Uh, but uh, And the results are incomplete. And when we took their test results to independent experts across the world and in India, top genetics uh, experts, they looked at the results and said that, of course, I mean, the result, test results are not complete. But there is more matching here than non-matching. So if we have to take a, a call here, there is a match here rather than a non-match. So you can't call it inconclusive. It's, it's a subjective uh, call, whether you call it inconclusive or not. Mm -hmm. That being so, there was another set of DNA tests carried out by the Central Forensic Science Laboratory in Kolkata. Now, this, this is something splendid happened there. They gave a very categorical response that the DNA tests, uh, the DNA samples, not not inconclusive as the other lab did, but they, this lab said the DNA results have not matched at all. So, what we did, we said, please give us uh, the basic document on the basis of which you have reached the conclusion. That's called an electroperogram. So the DNA sample is uh, put in the machine. The machine reads the uh, genetic sequence, the uh, gene sequence, and prints it out in a chart, in the form of a chart. Mm -hmm. And the genetic experts will look at the chart, and then they compare and match with it. Then they come to the conclusion. It's like a blood test report, so, uh, or, 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 or an ECG report or uh, an MRI report, you go to a doctor, you give them the report, they look at your report and just give their opinion. So we said, uh, where is that report? That report is missing. That report they won't give out. So th that is clear they are hiding something. But most astonishing part, 
most astonishing part, which beats all science, is that even before the test began in this lab, it was published in Calcutta's leading uh, Bengali daily. The results were published even before that test began. Six months before the tests were, the results were out, it was already published. The findings were already published. So, I mean, you call, uh, say, somebody like a uh, Lal Patil guy to your home, he comes to collect your blood sample, and he comes along with your blood test report. It is something like that. So, without testing, when even the tests have not been started, the results are out and printed in the newspaper. Okay. So, so either they have to be, uh, I mean, they have some kind of time machine, or they are, uh, they have some kind of supernatural power by which they can look into the future and then come back and write the report. So nothing explains this. So this, we expose this forensic fraud. So the handwriting matches, the DNA is more of a match than a non-match. Okay. So but all these kinds. Then, then how, how are you attributing the, the day of the death? Because you were very precise. You said he died in a certain April of 1960. Because there are eyewitnesses, his followers who were there, the local followers. There were at least uh, 13 to 15 people who were there who have testified uh, in front of commissions and in the commissions around. And uh, uh, based on their tes uh, testimonies, uh, that's the date we have got. And before us, uh, in 1985 itself, the local media, uh, local media carried on their own investigations and uh, published their stories, their conclusions. Uh, I will just take one minute to tell you a fascinating coincidence. This is called irony of fate. When Suhas was forced to leave India, in the Indian media circle, who are very rapidly anti suhas was uh, the editor of a newspaper called Amrita Bazar Patri. Uh, and his name was Tushar Kanti Ghosh. And Tushar Kanti Ghosh made it his business to go after Suhas's life, to make his life miserable, to lampoon him, to criticize him, at the drop of a hat for every word he spoke. The same Tushar Kanti Ghosh, was the editor of a newspaper, the, the news, the newspaper, which ran the longest uh, investigation on the so-called Gumnami Baba. And he saw the results. He commissioned the investigation. He saw the results. He accepted the results. So, same Tushar Kandri goes 1940 and 1985. So, that was another linking factor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, a couple of questions, sir. Before I conclude, um, so one of the one of the uh, people's wa people watching us, so uh, they asked, did Mukherjee Commission accepted a report of DNA te test on the teeth of uh, uh, Bhagbanji without seeing the report? Uh, is there any non-verbal evidence of the death of Bhagwanji in 1985? And did Dr. R. P. Mishra say in front of commission uh, that uh, Bhagwanji died in 1985 of September? These are very specific questions. I don't think they are very suitable for this kind, this okay. particular session. And uh, those uh, because this session is not on the mystery part or Dumnami <laughs> and Bhagwanji. I don't think I should get into that. Okay. Uh, maybe another time. Absolutely, sir. Thanks so much. I think it's it's been I think it's 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 been a lot of learning for me as as from a point of view of a journalist. I think I know something about history of this country, something about one of the uh, greatest men to have lived in on the Indian soil. And and thanks to you, thank you for taking time and thank you for elaborating on those questions. I'm sure your followers and followers of Bose have a lot more uh, knowledge, idea, and understanding of. Bose's uh, political philosophy, his economic, uh, you know, philosophies, as well as his socio-political and geographical philosophies uh, during the course when he was alive, and of course the big mystery that you that you've unraveled for me, which I'm going to, I think, uh, sleep on, is the fact that as opposed to all that we knew, perhaps Bose did not really die in 1945, and I think that 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 is something of a of a great mystery. We, we have captured this entire thing in a book called Conundrum. Conundrum, Subhas Bush's Life of the Death. Conundrum. It's co-authored by Anuj Dharani. So uh, yeah, if, you, if, you, if you like thrillers and mysteries, this is your book. Absolutely, sir. I, I think we're all going to sleep on that mystery. Thank you so very much for taking time. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Thank you for having me on the show. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks, to, all, you. thanks to all the... Uh, viewers, the audience who tuned in today, do subscribe to our YouTube channel. We look forward to having you back again. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jai Thank you, sir. Jai